Let's go take a look at ISACA's published standards. Now again, you're not expected to memorize these, but you are expected to know them in general and how they relate to the whole IS audit process. While we're looking at standards, we'll also look at some of the published guidelines and procedures. We'll even drill down a little bit, take a look at some tools. You're not expected to know the tools at all, but you are expected to understand the technology behind these tools and why these tools are chosen. So let's actually go to ISACA's website. And here's ISACA's website, and you can join, but there's a lot of stuff you can do without having to be a member of ISACA. And if we go up to the Knowledge Center up here, we can take a look right now at the standards. And this is a very, very handy page to take a look at. So we're going to take a look at the standards. When you're auditing, this is what I do. I have these standards handy sort of as a checklist, and depending upon what I'm auditing, I'm planning, and I'm working with a team, it's not just myself. Um, and we're, we're figuring out our strategy, okay, it's this particular type of business, it's this, they have these constraints and these kinds of conditions. And I just look at our plan and our strategy and everything we do, and I just double check it against the standards, sort of as a checklist. Are we still in compliance? And the whole reason why is so that we can maintain the highest level of standard and, and integrity. And that was the whole idea behind ISACA. Let's try to have standards and guidelines that work in any situation and people can always look to them and adhere to them to the best of their ability so that we're producing the best service, the best product. So when we look down here, we can see the IT audit and assurance standards and there's actually a link down here. And they talk about the goal is to advance globally applicable standards. Advance globally applicable standards that address the specialized nature of IT. And if we click more about standards, guidelines, tools, and techniques, it'll take us to where we can look at standards first. And here's something you do need to know. Standards are mandatory. You must adhere to standards. Whereas guidelines, they provide guidance and additional information. They're not mandatory, but they help you stay on track. And then there are specific tools and techniques. Let's actually look at the standards. Now, of course, they had the whole thing about the code of professional ethics, but let's actually take a look at some of the standards. We're going to view the standards right here. And we can see that the standards are published in a bunch of different languages. We're going to go to the English version right here. And notice that there are many standards, and they all start with an S in front of the number. So there are 16 standards starting with S, starting with the idea of having a charter for the audit. We're going to click the chart it, charter for the audit. And there's a little introduction and then what the standard itself is. And we can see for standard number one, purpose, responsibility, authority, and accountability of the IS audit function, meaning the audit that you're going to do, or the IS audit assignment should be documented in a charter or engagement letter. In other words, I should have a document that says, why are we doing this? Who's responsible? On whose authority are we doing this? Because let me tell you, you need absolute upper management authority saying, you can do this because you're going to run into all kinds of resistance down in the lower departments. And um, wh what is, who's accountable for all this? This should be clearly written down. So that's our first standard. Have a documented thing saying why we're doing it, who's doing it, who's responsible. So our very first thing, the idea of the audit charter. Going on to independence, the next thing here. In all matters related to the audit, you're independent. You do not answer to the people you're auditing. You don't even answer to the people who hired you except to give them the report. You are completely independent of who you're auditing in attitude and appearance. So that's your second standard. Next one, professional ethics and standards. And then, of course, now, as a CISA, as an ISACA auditor, we are going to 
adhere to the code of professional ethics that we looked at a little bit earlier. And we will exercise, and this really means exercising due professional care, including observing all applicable standards. We're going to do our very best and do due care, be complete, thorough, methodical. Our next standard, professional competence. We should be professionally competent for what we're actually auditing. Like I said, when you're auditing something large, you'll be part of a team, and you should be assigned to audit something that is within your realm of skills, your particular professional competence. Do not attempt to do things that are outside your realm of competence. I mean, because you're doing yourself and everyone else a disservice. That's why we have a team. Different people have different skill sets. So you should also maintain and improve your professional competence through continuing training and education. Going on to planning. We should plan this whole thing. We just don't go charging in there. We actually plan how are we going to do it, including the objectives. And this complies with any laws and also our professional standards. And here's a big one right here. We should develop and document a risk-based audit approach. We'll talk more about risk-based, but in short, risk-based means we start by identifying potential risks and we figure out, okay, uh, what is being done to mitigate those risks? Is anything being done to mitigate those risks? And the risks are not just to the system or the process or the people that we're auditing, but also to our own audit process itself. And we'll come back to risk-based auditing in a bit. Then we go ahead and we do the audit. We perform the work. And supervision, IS audit staff should be supervised to provide reasonable assurance that objectives are met. In other words, there will be a lead, and that lead will make sure that every person is doing what they're supposed to do in their part of the audit. Then reporting. We'll provide an appropriate report. And generally it starts with an executive summary and then it can drill down farther and farther but we provide a report because ultimately we want to give people some actionable item, some report they can look at that they can quickly understand and then they can go deeper and deeper as they need to. So we provide a report to the appropriate parties in a format that's appropriate for them as well. And so we'll see uh, the report will state our scope and our objective, what our findings and conclusions are. We'll also be open about what our limits were and um, also, we'll point to the fact that we gathered specific evidence and we'll point to the evidence in our report. Then, we're not done as auditors when we just say, here's the report, thanks, see ya. We come back. I mean, we have recommendations. We work with the managers. We, we work with the managers and we say, look, um, we found that you guys were uh, doing this and this. Uh, this, this and this happened, and it happened a bunch of times, and we traced it back because folks were doing it this way. We're not, like, saying, you're bad. That's not the point. We're helping them be compliant so that they can run their business in the best possible way. So our, our whole thing is we come back and we say, okay, um, the, we, we gave you about six months to try to correct this, and then we do a follow-up. Did they follow up on our recommendations or our requirements. So we come and we say, um, all right, sh we should request and evaluate relevant information to conclude whether appropriate action has been taken in a timely manner. What's the point of an audit if you don't act on it, right? And then irregularities and illegal acts, and this is a sensitive issue here. When you do an audit, chances are good, that you'll run into people who tried to hide things, who tried to conceal things. Um, and it may not be necessarily fraudulent, but they knew they were kind of cutting corners or skimping or, or not following procedure. And, and, and you'll find even senior management sometimes tries to hide things, tries to hide fraudulent activity. And, and so you need to realize that um, there's a good possibility you'll run into this. You should consider the risk of irregularities and illegal acts, but when you go in there, you 
have this sort of attitude of what they call professional skepticism, where you just go, I need to see first. You don't just trust them right off the bat. I mean, you're there not to trust. You're there to find out fact. And um, you realize that um, upper management may be trying to hide stuff, or lower management, or workers may be trying to hide stuff. And this is where your professionalism comes in. Um, you, you're not there to judge. You're there to gather evidence and form a, an opinion and um, make recommendations. And uh, further on, talking about IT governance. And the idea is whether or not, and, and this is a biggie, you know, I remember as a, a technologist, I started out as a system administrator, and back in those days, and, and this is like 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, um, the, uh, the whole world for IT people revolved around what we were doing. And what we didn't realize was that we were just part of a, biz a bigger business. And ISACA recognizes that when we do auditing, how IT is conducted must not just be something unto itself. The whole purpose of IT is to make the business work. The whole reason why we as IT technologists, why we do anything is so that the people who actually make the money can do their job and can do it effectively. So the management of IT, the governance of IT, IT governance must align to the organization's mission and vision. We don't just have firewalls because we like it. We don't have this particular operating system because it's cool. It's because it supports completely the organization's mission and vision and objectives and strategies. So we need to make sure that IS functions actually do that and they're governed to do that. Then we also talk about um, risk assessment. So when we do our audit, we do it as a risk approach. What are the risks? And like I said, we'll talk more about risk um, approach to auditing in a little bit. We, but we're going to be looking for risks and we're going to see are there any controls in place to mitigate those risks. When we collect evidence, audit materiality is is this substantial? You ever hear the term, oh, that's not material, or material evidence, it's immaterial? We're looking for stuff that has substance, that really has any meaning, that, that has any, um, uh, it, it actually will hurt the business or it will hurt the, um, uh, the IS process. So we're looking for something that actually has some substance to it, materiality. Also, using the work of other experts, Highly recommended you consider using the work of other experts who came before you. You should also judge whether or not that work was actually substantial and, and adequate. Going further on, um, as we gather evidence, there is a whole way of maintaining evidence. We need to get sufficient and appropriate evidence, evidence and we need to maintain it in a way that we can always account for from A to Z, uh, from the beginning to right now, were there any lapses in the control of that evidence in the chain of the ownership? More on evidence in a bit. And then we need to look at, for IT controls, what controls do the organization have in place? What, what controls do they have in place to try to reduce, mitigate risk? So do they have any controls? And we'll talk a whole lot more about controls in a bit. And then finally, trying to make sure that since so much business now is e-commerce, are there applicable controls for the e-commerce operations of that organization? And are the e-commerce transactions properly controlled? So those are the ISACA standards. Again, you don't need to memorize, but you need to know they exist and you need to know them in general. The next thing we're going to take a look at are the guidelines and the procedures.